If you are currently not going through a trial right now, one is coming. That's good news, right? That's, that's great. Thank you, Mitzi, for that reaction, because that's my reaction. That, I think, is probably most of our reactions, right? So when we think of trials, when we think of stuff going on, we are not jumping for joy. That's usually the last emotion, and we feel a lot of emotions. We feel a lot of stuff stirred up inside of us, but mine doesn't include joy, right? So if you're following along in our journey, so obviously we had Easter, we're a couple weeks out from that, but now what we're seeing is we're, we're, we're taking a picture or taking a look into the picture of the early church. What we're seeing as these disciples walked away, remember the ascension scene, they were looking up and two men came down and said, what are you looking at? Go, go share the gospel, go do the work. So, so they go and they went and they waited at a place for the appointed time, and then they start doing the ministry, right? The, the church, the early church. That we, we've talked about it. They, they established things. They were very, very selfless. They were selling uh, things that may have been extras in their life to make sure people in their community are taken care of. And, and, and you just got this awesome picture of this togetherness, this unity, this wholeness, all for this one mission, right? This mission of Christ, but then this week, in our readings this week, it takes a turn in chapter 7, right? Actually, chapter 5, I think, is really where. But it starts to take a turn. So those little seeds of persecution that were started to be planting, now they've grown. Now they've grown to a point where they martyred somebody, right? Stephen was stoned to death for preaching a very, very solid sermon, very, very good um, summary of what the old testament or his testament meant but i want to i want to show you something real quick in acts chapter 8 we're not going to be here we're going to actually going to be in the book of james today some of you maybe have guessed that already but i want you guys to see something here because we this week we read about the awesome transformation of someone we knew as saul and now know as paul but in chapter 8 before saul becomes paul before jesus knocks him off his horse literally in chapter 8, verse 1, it said this. This was right after, in chapter 7, right after Stephen was martyred. It says, Saul agreed with putting him to death. Saul was standing there when Stephen was stoned. He was part of this, these religious leaders, this council that was not going to have anyone who's following the way advancing their message, advancing the kingdom of God. He wasn't going to do it. He was so convinced that he was right in this, his, his religious... Um, pharisaical Sanhedrin, his council, his religious uppity up, he was the right way. Now, very, very passionate. We, we know that. We see that even in his writings when he actually converts to following Jesus. But I want you to see something because in, in verse 1, it says, he agreed to putting, with him, putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. So this really awesome picture of this unified church has a big issue now. They are facing a really big trial. And in fact, what that trial led them to do is scatter or disperse. Keep that in mind as we journey over to chapter 1 in the book of James because that's important to understand the true context in which James was writing. So we're going to be in chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. But there is a lot here. So first, let's, let's do just a quick introduction here. Who is James? There's a lot of James in the Bible, right? There's, there's several different ones, and if you follow them, um, in fact, we read about one James being beheaded this week in Acts, Right? That's not this James. So it's, it's important to understand exactly which guy we're talking about. But this James um, perhaps had a, a very, very different view of who Jesus was than we would today, or maybe even the disciples. Why do I say that? Because this Jesus was the half-brother, this James was the half-brother of Jesus. So this is Joseph and Mary's boy, James. Now, it's not the only brother. We know Jude was another one. We know that they had sisters. But this was the half-brother of Jesus. So this is someone who grew up in the household that Jesus grew up in. 
Take that for just a second, right? Oh, there's Jesus. Can't be like Jesus, right? I I don't know. That's reading into it a little bit. But I'm telling you that uh, because it's important. So this is uh, James. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Now, here's what's also pretty interesting. During the time of Jesus' ministry here on earth, Scripture tells us, John 7, 5, tells us his brothers were not followers of him. So Jesus, the Messiah, is walking the earth doing ministry, and John tells us in verse 7 5 that his earthly brothers were not followers of Jesus at this point. That's wild for an instant. Then you think, that makes kind of sense too, right? So that's who he was, and this is the same James that in 1 Corinthians 15 actually got a special revelation from Jesus. It tells us that Jesus appeared to over 500 men and James. He had this special revelation, this special visit from the resurrected Jesus. So now, in the context of where we are, James is the pastor at the church in Jerusalem. That's that's what he is now. Now he is a sold out follower of Jesus, his half brother, the Messiah. He's all in. He's he's leading the church in Jerusalem. So when we read in Acts 8 8, 1 that now that this church who's on fire is dispersed, you've got James, this pastor, standing there years later saying, Man, what do I do with this? I can only imagine, right? It's, it's hard. Some of you in here have been in ministry, been in ministry positions, and um, it, it's hard to shepherd people. It's hard to, to really be involved in so many different lives in so many different areas. It drags you all over, let alone everyone being all spread out because of this dispersion, because of the persecution that has driven them in all areas of the land. So that's who we're dealing with here. That's, that, that's, who did, that's who wrote this book, who wrote this. Now, James is probably my favorite book of the Bible. I like them all, but there's five chapters full of practical living, full of, you, you can read this. Now, I want you to, want you to see this here. We're going we're gonna to jump in in verse one because this is important. It says, James, a servant of God. If I was James, I might have said, James, the brother of Jesus. James, someone who grew up with the Messiah. James, someone who knows a little bit more than you do because I was there a lot more than you were. But we don't see that. We see James, a servant of God. Now, that word servant is interesting here. It's doulos. And what that actually means is a bond slave. So what a bond slave is and how that differs from a slave, a slave is someone who's kept there and a servant working there, and if they were given the chance to be free, they would probably be free. Now a bond slave is someone who says, I love my master and I want to be a slave or a servant here until the day I die. I am choosing to be your servant, to be your slave. That's the word that James uses here. So he says, James, me, I am someone who is choosing to be a slave of God. Someone who is purposely saying, I want to be a servant or a bond slave of God himself. I'm purposely putting myself in this position. And it's interesting here because there's a word and. That's pretty good right there, right? Oh man, that's a humble, that's a, you can see someone who's on fire. But it says, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So not only do I want to be a bond servant, not only do I want to be this servant, this slave, someone who, who has um, a, a responsibility to serve someone, not only do I want to do that of God himself, the big G God, right, the, the overarching creator, he takes it to the next level and says, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word Lord it's interesting here because it is curios. And that word, listen to this, means master, but specifically the master of the doulas. So what he's saying is he is submitting all authority not only to God, but to his brother, his half-brother, his Messiah, as the master of himself being the bond slave. He is giving all authority to King Jesus as rightfully so, in the position, in the place of God himself. So don't read this and say, well, he's saying that you got God here, but then you've also got Jesus kind of on another level. 
That's not what he's saying. He is saying that, that you've got God here, and I'm a bondservant to God, God himself, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the master of who I'm a servant to. So he is really confirming the deity of Christ through this one simple statement. This, this greeting, if you will, this intro that so often we would look at and say, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's nice. That's flowery. But there is so much theology packed into this because James is affirming who Jesus is and that he is truly God. He says, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad greetings. This is his intro. This is who he's writing it to. And who is it? The 12 tribes. Who are the 12 tribes? We read this, right? We, we walk through the Old Testament talking about the 12 tribes. This was, they, they would have known this. They would have known this phrase, the 12 tribes, as kind of a blanket phrase to kind of throw that over the Jewish nation, the Israelites, right? The, all the Jews, the 12 tribes, going all the way back to our ancestors. So we know that this was written to a Jewish audience, now, some may stop right there and say, I'm not Jewish, so this doesn't apply to me. Well, I think we've got to take it a step further and understand that this is written to those Jewish folks who are called to be believers in the King Jesus. So when you look at it that way, when you look at it and understand that this is for all believers, can I tell you something? It's for me. I'm not Jewish, but this is for me. You're not Jewish, but this is for you. So it's important for us to read this, and specifically in his time, he says dispersed abroad. Why did he say that? We read that in Acts chapter 8, right? They were dispersed. So James is writing this letter to, to give some practical application, probably some things that he has seen in his church. He's writing this letter, trying to get everyone on this same accord. So this is years after, they do think this may be one of the earliest books written in the New Testament as far as uh, Jesus' death and resurrection and then this being written, but we're still thinking 10 to 20 years after this death. So we, we've got this, this picture of this church being scattered and James seeing this practicality or seeing this practical stuff saying, man, I, I really need to reach out to my brothers and my sisters and say, this is how we ought to be living for our Messiah and, and really trying to hold this church together here in Jerusalem. So that's who it's to. That's what it's about. And, and I implore you, we're going to read four verses today. And we're going to read through the book in, in our daily reading. This is not a long book, which I'm a fan of. But it is packed with things that you and I and every single one of us, man, we can learn a lot from the book of James. It applies so much. So let's jump in, verse 2. This is where his message begins. And it's interesting that this is the first thing that he chooses to address. Now again, when you look at it in context, maybe it's not so surprising, because we know that everyone's scattered. We know that there's persecution. We know that there's people being martyred. People are being killed for their belief. But he says this, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Do you think when he sat down to pen that, he said, this sounds funny. You guys ever written something? You're like, I don't know if that just sounds like what I mean. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he was very, very to the matter of fact. But folks, I got I, I, I to gotta admit, I, I don't consider it great joy when I'm facing experience or, or experiencing various trials. That is not my natural reaction. Anybody in here, that's their natural reaction? If it was, I would say, good, that's a sign of spiritual maturity. But I think we would all agree that when we face trials, when we face things in our life, usually the first expression or emotion that we feel is not, yes, so joyful. In fact, I'm one of the guys that really, really has a hard time looking through the storm to even see what's on the other side. I'm someone who will focus so much on the storm and be like, there's no way out of this. There's times Teresa has to kind of talk me off a cliff, a proverbial cliff. Okay? Just saying, listen, there's going to be something on the other side. But it's so hard for me sometimes to look through that fog and have that, that, that ability to look through and see, man, there is something after this. So let's, let's talk about this for just a second. He, he addresses them first as brothers and sisters. 
We see this act of, I mean, we saw this when we walked through the John, the first, the second, and third John. This, this, is a, this is a sign of affection. This is a sign of someone who cares. This isn't something like, let me just give you guys instructions. This is someone saying, hey, brothers and sisters in Christ, come on, this is, this is from the heart. This is something. And when he says, consider it a great joy, some versions say pure joy. I like that version, pure joy. Man, when something's pure, something's good, right? You're going to pay more if you see something pure at the store, right? If it's pure honey, you're paying more than if it doesn't say that word. There's this, there's this concept behind this word pure or great or, or huge that just doesn't fit here sometimes in our thinking. Consider it great joy. You know what I find joyful? I find joyful spending time with my family, seeing my kids accomplish things, um, going on dates with my wife. You know, I've got a lot of things that I could put into the category that just give me joy, just earthly joy. But facing trouble isn't usually one. And he's telling them to consider it a great joy. Now, it's interesting because he doesn't really give us context. Are you talking about be joyful and be smiley and be happy? Or are we talking about this innermost joy that which we only find in our salvation in Christ Jesus, right? I really think he's probably encapsulating both. And here's what I mean. I do believe that he is calling us to face trials a total different way than everyone else does. Total different way than we feel as naturally being able to face joy. But I think even at a greater level, he is telling us that we should consider and we should not forget who our true joy is no matter what, period. And those of us in here who say, I'm a believer of King Jesus, folks, that is our source of joy. That, we, we can talk about this. This isn't happiness. He didn't say, be happy. He says, find this joy, this deep joy. Happiness changes with our circumstances, right? But we can still be joyful because of the one who is in us. Consider it a great joy. Whenever... I think mine says whenever. Does anybody say, does anybody say if ever? Anybody? Okay. Or if? It shouldn't. Because it says when. <laughs> James isn't saying if you guys fall into some tough times. He's saying when you guys fall into some tough times. When. It is going to happen. That's what he's saying. He said it's not a question of if it will happen. It's when it will happen. Whenever you experience these various trials. Verse 3 says this, because you know, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Because you know. I like that word. I'm glad that he included that word. I'm glad he didn't say because the testing of your faith. I'm glad he included because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance. I think if we were all pretty honest with ourselves and we kind of thought back to past trials, big, small, what's big to some is small to other and vice versa, when we think past to the past in those trials and we, we kind of look before, we look through maybe where we were, and then we look afterwards. Now that doesn't mean, I'm not saying that every one of those trials turned out exactly how we would have planned them here on this earth. But when we look back, can I tell you something? When I look back at trials that I've went through in my life, I can see without a shadow of a doubt that God was working on something through me or the people around me during those trials. I don't care what it is. I don't, the, the biggest thing that happened to me in high school is when my parents got divorced. It rocked my world. I was a senior. I was too cool for school. And boom, big, mind-blowing thing. In the time, I couldn't see past it. It was because of that divorce that I surrendered my life to Jesus. That's wild to me. Sometimes I sit and think, man, what would happen if that never happened? And I'm not saying every single situation is just, oh, it's got this rosy ending. 
Because we've lost loved ones that don't make sense. It just does not make sense. We're in situations right now where we can still, maybe we're even past the trial, but we're still scratching our head like, man, what is this teaching us? Where are we because of this? But I know, and and James knows, he says, because you know. You know that when you go through trials, it produces this endurance. Endurance. Folks, sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that. Why? Because we see the effects of the storm right in front of us, and it's hard for us to look past. The testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, here's what I want you guys to see here, because this is really, really important. Because sometimes you can read this and kind of get a different meaning, I think, than what it means. Um, the testing of your faith produces endurance. It does not say the testing of your endurance produces faith, right? It doesn't say that. So here's what it's, here, here's what it's saying. And to just kind of wrap this verse up in a nutshell. Because you know, why do you know? Because you already have the faith, and through that faith and through these trials, you gain endurance, Right? He doesn't say that this all, these trials, this builds your faith. This is where faith comes from. That's not what he's saying. This produces faith. He's saying because of the faith that you have, knowing that God is going to do something through this, now you're going to produce endurance. That's something totally different than producing faith. What is endurance? Some, some say steadfastness. I like endurance because this endurance is talking about the quality that it takes to finish a marathon. Any marathon runners in here? Any? Yeah, we got one on the road here. I ran one in my entire life. And some of you are like, yeah, I figured you have. Just kidding. I was in <laughs> Okinawa and uh, my chaplain, Chaplain Bailey, convinced me, persuaded me, made me sign up for the Naha Marathon. This must have been 2009, I guess. And then we went on deployment. And we went on deployment. Usually we're on a nice big ship. The USS Essex has got a flight deck. I mean, it's, I think two laps was a mile. I mean, it's huge, right? So, and then we got a full gym and treadmills and all this stuff. That's the ship we always deployed on, but surprise, that ship was broke down, so they put it in the yards, and they sent us on the USS Denver, an LPD-9. It's a Vietnam-era ship. They had two treadmills, (laughs) No flight deck, no nothing. The most I had run in my preparation for this marathon was six miles at one time. And I thought, I am going to die, right? I am going to die. So because I already paid the $40 and I at least wanted to get a t-shirt, I win. And we go there, but what I realized is we get there and there's, it's like a parade. It, 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 was, it was awesome. And, and so we're, we take off, we're running, and I was in a little bit better shape then. And we get to the uh, about the eight mile mark, I remember seeing a sign, it was all in kilometers, but I'm telling you, a parade, they've got, you know, all sorts of just stuff going on at the show, I mean, it was huge, it was easy, like, it wasn't even like I was running, I was just kind of there in a parade, and then we bust kind of through that eight mile mark, and we get to that half marathon, that 13.1 miles, and right there, is where the temptation sat in, because there's a whole load of buses right there, because some people sign up to run a half marathon, And those buses are designed to take you right back to your car at the finish line because you completed your half marathon. And at this point, me and Chaps are still running together, and he's run 20-some marathons, and he's, I mean, he's a marathon runner, and he's got the endurance that I don't. And I'm like, I'm sticking with this old guy, right? Like, I've got this. And as tempting as it was for me to peel off and say, I accomplished a half marathon, I said, I'm going for it. We're going to. Man, that was, I'm already halfway done. Let's go. How bad can it be? As soon as you pass that, the parade ends. <laughs> and, and now you're in these hills and valleys that weren't there in the first half, right? Beautiful views, but I didn't care. <laughs> I was trying not to, to die, right? To, to the point where now, instead of parades, instead of people like cheering you on, it's little Japanese guys like spraying your legs with icy hot, right? It's like, I know this is not good for you. Chaps leaves me in the dust, you know, I'm, now I'm doing the walk-run thing, like, oh, I've just got to get there, thinking if it's shorter to go back to the half mile or the halfway or just keep going. And, and finally, finally, after it was just shy of five hours, 
You marathon runners know that's a long time. Get to the finish line. And I'm like, they're wrapping things up, right? And me and this group are coming in like dying. They're like, oh, yeah, we got some medals left. Here you go. My only experience, and it will be my only experience. And I say all that to say this. There is an endurance that, uh, there's a quality that you need to have an endurance to run a marathon. There is a quality that you have to have, and I don't have it anymore, that's why I quit, that mentally, that physically, that it takes for someone to run 26.2 miles. It's an endurance that just, it's a mindset. You just have to keep going. Now imagine for just a second if I would have sprinted as far as I could, as fast as I could. I said, I want to lead this whole parade, right? I want to be the first one that everyone sees. I'm going to just sprint the whole time. We all know what would have happened, right? I wouldn't even got to the front before I was gassed and I'm done. Because a marathon is not a sprint. Now a 40-yard dash is a sprint. If I run in a marathon pace in a 40-yard dash, I'm getting smoked, right? But if I run at a 40-yard dash pace in a marathon, I'm still getting smoked. I say all that to say this. Our life, and, and Scripture alludes to it, our life is like that of a marathon, right? You guys would agree that it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. And I don't say that in a bad way, because I want to live till I'm 90. I want to see grandkids and great-grandkids. I, I want that. But to have that, especially to have that and maintain my faith, I have to have this endurance. I have to have this spiritual endurance that understands that things are going to have to happen to me in this life to prepare me for this endurance to keep going and keep going and keep going. I know that if I had trained harder and ran more than six miles, I would not have been so worthless in the last half of that marathon. But because I didn't go through the trials of training or the repetition of training, guess what? I was not prepared for the full thing. Now, I love the fact that I didn't have to run all those miles on the front side and have to suffer all that pain of that tray. It's crazy how much marathon runners run before the marathon. Like it's, Terry could probably attest, it feels like you just ran 16 marathons just to run one. But without that training, that never happens. And that's the same thing for us in this life. Because without the trials, without the lessons that God teaches us through the tough times in our life, can I tell you, we'll never have the endurance to finish the race. And that's what he goes on to talk about in verse 4. He says, Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Mature and complete, lacking nothing. See, this endurance, this isn't passive. This isn't passive waiting. Some versions say patience, and I think the only person who needs patience is a doctor but this is not the patience of like i'm gonna sit in a waiting room and i'll be patient for my turn even though i know it's my turn because six people have come in after me and they're still going it's not that patience it is this active endurance it is actively actively taking action understanding that things happen but it's building me why because that endurance for it to have its full effect, to it, for it to reach completion. That's what it takes that you and I are mature, spiritually mature, and complete, lacking nothing. Some versions say perfect. <laughs> Who in here wants to be mature, complete, and lacking nothing, right? We want that. I asked at the very beginning, who wants these trials? None of us want those. But what James is telling us, what he's teaching us here, that if we want this maturity, if we want this completion if our, in our life, if we want to be lacking nothing, it takes those trials. I was studying for this, and part of me was like, okay, I'll preach it, because I have to. Some of you are in here listening like, okay, I'll listen because I have to. 
that's an easy stance for us to take because that's the easier way for us. Now, I want to clear a couple things up here because I think, because that sounds good. That sounds nice. We can sit here. We can talk about that. We can even probably pep ourselves up to a point where like, all right, bring on the trials. Let me find what God's working on me, you know, through these trials, and, and yeah, I'll be better on the other side. And, and we can maybe even kind of convince ourselves mentally that that's what we want. But here's what we got to understand, because I think that our culture, I think that even American Christianity to an extent, has got this so twisted that the, the definition of mature, complete, lacking nothing means we're going to be prosperous. It means we're going to have such a gravy life. It means that once our trial days are done, oh, we're we retired. We retire from our Christian faith and we live off our 401k, right? But that's not what he's saying because in fact, this mature, this complete, lacking nothing, you know when that's going to happen for us believers? When we die. That's when it happens for us. When we finish the race, when our walk on this earth is completed and we look at King Jesus face to face and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's when we become mature, complete, lacking nothing. So what is James telling us here? James is telling us here that this whole idea, this whole goal of facing our trials, looking at them, saying, man, how is God using these trials in my life? How can, how can I benefit from these? The, the result, that benefit, that, that building up, that completion, that maturity, it's not even here in this world. Now some of you are like, okay, uh, oh, this stinks even more. Because now I've got to go through this stuff to not even reap this fullness. But folks, this is where it comes into this uh, of, of having an eternal mindset. If I asked you guys right now, what your mindset, everything that you do on this earth, is it for earthly things or is it for all eternity? I'm not saying just your earthly responsibilities are forgiven, Okay. Don't hear that. But what I'm saying, in the midst of us handling our earthly responsibilities and our families and our jobs and our, and our church and everything else that we've got going on, we have to look at that, we have to handle things in a way, through a lens, that we're actually looking forward through into eternity. We have to be looking at things saying, okay, I see these trials, I see how God's working, I see, but how does that affect my eternity or the eternity of those around me? It's so important because when we have the mindset of I'm gonna work through these trials because something good's gonna happen to me on this life, in this world, I'm gonna have money, I'm gonna have the nice house, I can retire, not have to worry about anything. Man, that's such a self-centeredness. That's, that's not the gospel, that's not being mature right there. We just lost all three because we're not mature, spiritually enough mature to understand what he's talking about. We're not mature, we're not complete, we're not lacking nothing. Now when we get to our eternal resting place, now I believe that if you're a believer, your eternal life has begun. It happened when you surrendered your life to King Jesus, but your eternal home is still awaiting you. That is what and when you become mature, complete, and lacking nothing. Lacking nothing is not the prosperity gospel. <laughs> lacking nothing is not you're going to have whatever cars you want, whatever houses you want, you have money to pass down to your kids when you die. That's not what he means by saying, if you just get through these, your earthly life's going to be gravy. Remember the context in which he's writing. People are dying for their faith. Imagine if they read this and be like, oh, I just got to get through these trials and my life's golden. They didn't read it that way. They read it with an eternal mindset, knowing that even if I die for my Savior and for what I believe, I will become mature, complete, lacking nothing because I'm all eternity with our Savior. That's two different outcomes. And then the second thing that I think we get wrong, sometimes we... Sometimes we misunderstand, maybe that's a better way to put it, is that you and I have a responsibility to see our trials as joy. 
we have that responsibility. Because here's why. Have you guys ever been through trials, been bitter, been angry, been mad, get through it, and you could probably sit here, look back, you'd be like, yeah, nothing good came from that. <laughs> well, it's not going to. Why? Because we're not looking at it as a place where it's testing us, and, and we're not looking to, to really say, God, how can, I, how can I learn from this? What can my eternal mindset be in this situation? Instead, we're just all bitter about everything. Folks, you don't got to go far to find bitter old people. Sorry if you're old or bitter. You don't have to go far to find them. And I, I truly believe that they're probably, and I don't know them all, I'm judging here, so I'm sorry. God forgive me. But I have to imagine that, that some of the characteristics of their earlier life had to have been trials. We all go, go through them. We know they have trials. But as they go through them, they're just angry about everything. Why did this happen to me? How did that? There's nothing good in this world. There's, you guys know who I'm, you may even have a, someone pop in your mind. I don't know. We have a responsibility when we face a trial to sit down and cry out to God. And say, God, I, my prayer is like, God, I don't like this. <laughs> know that I don't want to endure this. Know that this isn't my plan for me. But I surrender to your plan for me. Show me what you're teaching me. Show me what I'm supposed to be getting through this trial. See, that's totally different than being angry every step of the way. And in fact, if we had time to just continue on, which I'd love to, he goes right into, now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. If some of you lack the wisdom or even the knowledge to, to how to process this, cry out to God. Look to him, not to ourselves, not inward. And he continues this theme. And, and, and so, folks, I want us to see that our trials, the tough stuff in our life. I look out here, I know situations that some of you guys are going through. I know. I could also say, I don't know how you're getting through them, because I know they're tough. I can also say, I can't relate, because they're tougher than I've been through. But without a shadow of a doubt, I can promise you that if we take these trials on, however bad the earthly trial is, if we can take that on with the mindset of God, pour yourself out on me, show me, lead me, spirit, guide me through this, I know without a shadow of a doubt, when that comes through there, with an eternal perspective, you can look back and say, God, I see what you did through, my life, through that trial in my life. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next year. But as we walk through these trials, you know, that's what James says, you know because you have faith. If you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be a believer. You know because of your faith that these trials, that these tests produce endurance. They make you complete, they make you mature, and they will leave you at the end of this life lacking nothing. Folks, I hope that's an encouragement. This is a weird message because it's like, this isn't encouraging, right, that we're going to face trials. But it is encouraging because it changes our perspective on what trials are to us, how trials can affect us. Listen, I, I said this something, I don't remember what it was. The very worst thing that could happen to me in any single trial for me, if I'm being super selfish, is I die, right? The worst trial I could ever face, sickness, accident, it doesn't matter. The worst thing that I could face personally is death on this earth. But can I tell you something? That'd be the best thing spiritually that ever happens to me because I see King Jesus. I'm eternally with my creator for all, forever. We can't even comprehend that. That changes how I live. That changes how I look at things because the worst thing that happens is the best thing that happens to me. I'm not saying I'm just jumping for joy and I'm going to just make sure I get there by driving 160 mile an hour down the interstate. But what I'm saying is when we live with the mindset that God, if, if we see every trial, we see everything that you that you're allowing to happen in our lives, we see every single one of those as joy, as, God, what are you doing in my life? 
the worst case scenario isn't so bad. I'm going to pray and the worship team's going to come up. And I pray that you guys are challenged this morning. Challenged to maybe even take a step back. <laughs> Say, there's my trial pile. And you take a step back and we start sorting through our trials. Because it would be really nice if, one of, if we all had one trial at a time, right? And we sort through our pile. And say, God, what are you teaching me through this situation? What are, you, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing in my family's life? How can I be more mature? What can I learn? How can I be more complete through this? And we cry out to God. Say, God, you show me. You lead me. You teach me. And then we go to trial number two. God, what are you, what are you working in our lives through this? Guys, go ahead and close your eyes for me. Because I think so often we think, yeah, these trials, though, they're only from the enemy, so how, how can this be? I'm going to read a quick verse, and then I'm going to pray from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. It says, So then, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. Peter's rewriting what James said here. He's saying those who are suffering, listen to this, according to God's will. According to God's will. I think we would all stand here and say, man, I so want to be in the center of God's will in my life. Because we associate that with great things. Peter's saying, those who suffer according to God's will, listen to this, entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing what is good. Guys, that is encouraging. No matter what trial you're going through, no matter what trial your family's going through is affecting you, we have a faithful creator who has a will that is so much bigger than ours, so much more understanding than we could ever understand. And we're called to do what is good. We're called to be faithful to this faithful creator. Folks, God's before every trial, God's with you in every trial, and God will be there through every single trial we walk through. My prayer today is that those of us who call ourselves believers in King Jesus can face every trial head on. Say, God, show me what you're teaching me. Show me how I can be complete, how I can be mature, how I can lack nothing through this trial. Father, we come to you this morning thankful for the book of James. Thankful for this practical application of real things that happen in our life every single day, sometimes every hour. God, I want to pray right now for everyone sitting in this room right now that's going through a trial. Father, that's probably every single one of us. God, I don't, I don't want to pray that every single one of those trials work out how we want them to work out. That's not my prayer this morning. My prayer this morning is that every single one of those trials teaches us something, that it works out according to your will, and God, that we're okay with it. Because God, when we realize, when we understand that it is your will, when we accept that it's your will, and we are okay with it, Father, that's where maturity happens. That's where endurance happens. So, Father, I pray for the trials that our members are going through. But I pray, I pray we can find a joy because we know the faithful Creator. Father, if there's anyone in this room who may not know King Jesus as their Savior. I pray that they would understand today that there's no way to get through trials without you. There's no way to reach this maturity, this completion, this lacking nothing state without Jesus as our Messiah. 
without being a servant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you work in our lives. I pray the Spirit guides us. I pray that we have a new lens on trials in our life, that we can look at them through your eyes, through eternal mindset. Father, as we continue worshiping you through song, I pray that I pray that our words aren't empty. I pray that we don't walk out of here and say, that was nice. But Father, we, were, we walk out of here and truly, truly have an eternal mindset on what we're going through in this world. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can stand.